பகவான்ஸ் அட்டண்ட் வெங்கட்ரத்னம் பார்ட் டூ ஸ்ரீ வெங்கட்ரத்னம் லிவ் வித் பகவான் ஃப்ரம் நைன்டீன் ஃபார்ட்டி ஃபோர் டு நைன்டீன் ஃபிஃப்டி ஜூர் தி லாஸ்ட் இயர் ஹி சர்வ் அஸ் ஒன் ஆஃப் ஹிஸ் பர்சனல் அட்டண்டன்ஸ் came to Sri Ramanashramam from the USA in 1968, attached himself to Vengatratnam and diligently served him until his passing in 1976. Neil's immersion into spiritual heritage of India under the guidance of Vengatratnam is elaborately described in his book On the Road to Freedom, a pilgrimage to in india he now resides at amrita nanda mai mas kerala ashram and is known as swami paramatma nanda in the following article details regarding the life of vengatratnam have been extracted from a 25 page essay written about vengatratnam by neil rosner He presented this manuscript to us 30 years ago at Sri Ramanashramam. Wanderings and Company of Saints During the subsequent 10 years after Bhagavan's Mahasamadhi, Vengatratnam spent his time going on pilgrimage, meeting with devotees, Mahatmas and saints, but always in returning to Arunachalam and Bhagavan's ashram. In 1956, Sri Vengatratnam went to Kerala on foot and took a vow not to ask anyone for food or water and only to accept whatever was given unasked. He also chose not to disclose his identity as a disciple of the Maharishi to anyone during his travels in Kerala and he did not carry money with him. He spent about six months like this depending entirely on God in order to test how deep his surrender actually was. Back in Sri Ramanashramu, In 1967, the Maha Kumbhabhishekam of Sri Ramana Maharishi's Samadhi was performed and Vengatratnam was then requested to serve in the ashram. He continued this service until September 1969. I first met Vengatratnam, writes Neil Rosner, in September 1968. Vengatratnam was returning to his room after completing the seva at Sri Ramana's Samadhi. When I saw his face, which was glowing with Tejas and Ananda, a shock went through my being and I wondered who he might be. The next night, I met him on the hill where he was talking to some devotees about divine consciousness. Someone asked, What is the flash of divine consciousness? He replied that it is like a flash of lightning which illumines everything for a moment and then everything is dark again. Just then, there was a brilliant flash of lightning, as if to demonstrate what he has just said. A routine in the ashram. At this time, Sri Vengatratnam was very busy with his daily routine, which was roughly as follows. 3.30 a.m., got up, swept the room, went to the latrine, etc. 4.30 a.m. finished bath, sandhya, that is puja, japa, and cleaned his altar. 5.15, 
went to Bhagavan's Samadhi, cleaned and swept it and then arranged for the 6.15 Puja. From 7 to 8.15, he performed his own Pancha Yatana Puja. 8.15 to 9.15, he did Samadhi Puja and from 9.30 to 11.30, did Japa and studied the Srimad Bhagavatam. Then he partook of food. From 12 to 2 p.m. he rested or spent the time in visiting and meeting devotees. 2 to 4 p.m. he wrote letters etc. 4 p.m. bath. 4.30 to 6.30 Samadhi Shrine work. Veda Parayana and Puja. 6.30 to 7 p.m. Sandhya and Japa. 7.30 was meal time and 8 to 11 p.m. miscellaneous activities or satsang. 11 p.m. sleep. It was at this time that I started assisting him in work like picking flowers for puja, sweeping or any other service he might give me to do. While near Bhagwan's Samadhi, he would not speak to anyone unless it was regarding the immediate work at hand. He often said, the Samadhi is the same as Sri Bhagwan. As I felt near his body during his lifetime, I feel the same near his Samadhi now. It is him only. Frequently, he would go on Giri Pradakshina during the night after 8.30, usually returning only the next morning and then again start the daily routine without even resting. I asked him how he could bear the strain day after day. He simply said that when there is love of God, one does not feel any strain, however great it may be. It is only when the love and interest go away that boredom and strain are felt. If any new bhaktas would come to visit from outside, he always made it a point to go and meet them and spend time with them, more so if they had real devotion and sincerity. He spent many sleepless nights like this in Satsang. In 1967, on 14th of May, he met with His Holiness Sri Chandra Sekharendra Saraswati Swamiji, Jagadguru Sankracharya of Kanchi Kamakuti Pitam for the third time and received from him Mantra Diksha of Shiva Panchakshari Mantra. He also received a Hayagriva Salagram from His Holiness. After this, he used to daily repeat 2000 to 3000 Gayatri Mantras and 5000 to 10,000 Panchakshari Mantras. By the middle of 1969, he had done 14 lakhs, which is 1.4 million of the Panchakshari Mantra. In August 1969, he decided to somehow complete the minimum number of Japa as recommended by His Holiness and proceed to Hyderabad to perform the yearly Shraddha of his parents. To do this, he had to sit for Japa eight hours a day and after finally finishing it, he had a physical breakdown. After some days bedridden, he left for Hyderabad in October 1969. Hospitalization When I came to Hyderabad to meet him, I found him in Osmania, 
General Hospital with a fractured right hip. Riding as a passenger on a scooter, he was struck by a taxi. When I asked him how he had such an accident, he said, What accident? Is birth an accident? Is there any such thing as an accident for a bhakta? It is the sweet will of the Lord. That's all. The area around his hospital bed literally became an ashram with photos of Sri Ramana and Arunachala. Observance of occasional festivals like Ramana Jayanti and Kartik the Bodhisattvam. There seemed to be a continuous stream of devotees from 9 a.m. till midnight or later. Usually in the nights I expected that I could get some rest but at that hour the attending physician who was a bhakta used to come and enjoy the satsang till midnight or 1 a.m. At this time his revered friend Avadutendra Saraswati Swamiji came to Hyderabad to see him and visited him every day for some time. Sri Gangeshwarananda Swami, a great blind Vedic scholar, also came to the hospital and Sri Venkatrapnam did Pada Puja to him from the bed itself and then presented him with new clothes, etc. A number of other saints also came. At the time of going into the operation room, Sri Venkatrathnam suddenly experienced such a high state of divine ecstasy that he felt that the operation could be done without the usual anesthesia. As he was feeling completely devoid of identification with the body. Most of the people present mistook this ecstasy for either fear or insanity, but the real bhaktas recognized it as a very high state. After returning from the operation, the area around his bed was serene with a piece of a Brahman radiating all round while bhajans went on for a long time. Afterwards, Vengatratnam used to say to the more worldly devotees, See, you people say that I am a sadhu and that if I fall sick, who will look after me since everyone is so busy with his own family affairs and has no time to attend to a sick sadhu? Well, who sent this Nilu? The name he called Neil Rosner. Here, I did not write to him or call him to come here. God has sent him here to look after me. It is said that God himself takes on the responsibility to look after those devotees who depend entirely on him. Now you can see the truth of it. After four months, he was discharged from the hospital and stayed at Malakpet with Sri V. Srinivasan, who was the Inspector General of Prisons at that time. He and his wife treated Sri Vengatratnam with the fullest hospitality and affection for more than two months. For the rest of his life, he was grateful to them for the love and concern which they had showered on him at that time. This was May 1970. Pilgrimage to the Himalayas From Hyderabad, we travelled north with Swami Avadhutendra Saraswati and eventually reached Nepal in August 1970. After Swamiji left us in Kathmandu, we flew to Pokhara and from there walked 70 miles into the Himalayas to Muktinath, the abode of Muktinarayana. 
This place is sometimes called Salagram Chetra and is the 107th Dham on earth, Vaikunda being the 108th. This walk was extremely difficult. We often got lost in the forest and were caught in the darkness before we could reach the next village. Because I was a foreigner and lacked security clearance, government officials made me stop about 10 miles before reaching Muktinath, a politically sensitive area at the time. Vengatratnam and his sister proceeded alone. The way was very dangerous and windy and they even turned back once or twice thinking that they would get blown into the Russian river far below. One night before reaching Muktinath, Sri Vengatratnam suddenly got up and was loudly repeating Vishnu Sahasar Namam at about 1 a.m. In the morning, he told me that he had a vision of people with water parts on their heads going from a river to a temple which had a big chakra in front of it. He had woken up to the loud sound Narayana, Narayana ringing in his ears as if someone were shouting it in the room. It was then that he started doing the Vishnu Sahasranamu. He said that usually when he gets within a certain distance of the destination, he will have a dream about the deity of that place and the name Shiva or Narayana will be ringing in his ears. When they finally reached Muktinath, sure enough, there was a big chakra in front of the temple as he had seen in the vision. Proceeding to Durgapur, we accompanied his sister, her husband and daughter to Gaya, Kashi and Priyaga doing Shraddha and Puja in all the places. This took about three weeks. When we reached Jansi, we unexpectedly found Swamiji there and spent about two weeks at Brahmacharyji's ashram. From that time till mid-1972, we were either at Arunachalam or traveling with Swamiji to various bhajans and saptahas, that is, day and night bhajan programs. Murganar in 1973, Sri Murganar, one of the intimate sishyas of the Maharishi, attained Siddhi in the ashram. Vengatratnam personally performed the 40-day puja Hathiya Samadhi and also the Mandalabhishekam. During all this time, he suffered from chest pain and weakness but nevertheless finished his duty to your brother Bhakta.